In order to address the climate crisis, we all know that we need to innovate. But in order to innovate, we do need to know where we think the space for innovation is going to be. And there's lots of ways that we can do that. So we can have engineers, we can have economists, we can have consumer behaviorists, we can have scientists tell us where we should go. But the interesting thing about making sense of where we can be in the future is that that is a interpretation process. And there's lots of research in the social sciences that shows how we talk about the world now or in the future or in the past is how we shape the movement of where we're gonna go next. So in a sense, we talk things into action. That sounds easy and that sounds fine if we have a good imagination or we know people that do. But the interesting thing about the climate crisis is that it's hard to connect all of the dots. And when people are trying to make sense of things, often what we do, and again, this is supported by research, is that we pay attention to the things that seem normal to us or where we are, are familiar or where we think is the answer. And we don't pay attention to surprises. There's lots of research that shows, in fact, what we do with surprises, we have shock, horror perhaps, or humor. And then we move back to our cozy, comfortable world. And we all know from the past year that paying attention to the surprising things, even if they seem far away in the distance, actually is pretty important if we want to protect ourselves from things like a pandemic that's happening at one part of the world. Now, I remember being at Davos in 2020, and lots of us were talking about the, 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 you know, the, the coronavirus that was kicking off in Wuhan. And, you know, amazingly, that was the end of January 2020, uh, there was not that much discussion about gosh, maybe we will be locked down for the next year ourselves. We were very busy talking about climate change and innovation. I run something called Arctic Base Camp. So we always do a series of events on why the changing Arctic poses global economic risks around the world. But there were many, many others talking about climate change. And, and all of us, of course, were, were worried what was happening in Wuhan, but for that region of the world. And literally within a few weeks, we found that the world as we knew it had changed. And that's because we weren't able to connect the dots despite the fact that science, and in this case, medical science, had told us that we actually had to pay attention to things exactly as they were. So the coronavirus was not an unknown or an impossible unknown. What it was actually was something that we just consistently did not pay attention to, whether that was uh, someone like me, a climate science scientist that was focused on something else or a business executive or a government official. We all kind of thought that our world as we knew it wasn't going to change. So when we talk about the spaces that will open up, those are spaces that can be filled with risk. Those are spaces that can be filled with opportunity. And often they're the same kind of space. But the trick is when we're looking at sense making is to try to pay attention to what seems like a weak cue or a far away uh, um, warning sign um, or something that's vague. And don't ignore the puzzle, don't ignore the surprise, but actually try and bring it in and bring innovation right to the forefront. Now, again, that's easier said than done. And here, I wanna give you another example that's more climate related and more about how we pay attention to knowledge. So let me talk about Greenland in around 2009, 2010. Now, obviously local Greenlandic people that live there know a lot about what was happening and, and happening on, on, on that, that, that large ice sheet. And of course, there's a lot of scientists that do fundamental research and have really detailed observation sites uh, where they consistently monitor things. Well, and that was indeed indeed the case. But at the same time, there was a local hunter and he went uh, to a fjord that he, he knew well near Nuuk and it was filled with dead red fish. And it was really puzzling. I mean, there was thousands of them and he couldn't make sense of it. And nor could all of any of his, his colleagues and peers and community members. And it was really puzzling to them. And they spent a lot of time talking about it. They'd never seen it before. They didn't have any historic stories. So the hunter went up actually to the scientific uh, center and, and you know tried to talk to people that he knew there. And he finally got attention of a scientist and was saying, you know, 
this is really unusual. We really need to take a look at what these dead redfish mean. Now, for most of us, if we're in a certain uh, building or organization, someone coming in and talking about dead redfish, we might not really pay that much attention. I mean, you know, we're not reliant on dead redfish. Why does it matter? Well, luckily, this scientist actually said, well, you know what, maybe we should go up on top of the glacier uh, uh, with, with, with um, uh, um, uh, an airplane and see what's going on. And in fact, what they discovered was that a glacial lake had drained unexpectedly. It had obviously been warming from the bottom down. There had been a moulin that went down and the water rushed down and up into the fjord and the sheer pressure of that killed a lot of the dead, the, the redfish that were in the fjord, which was a warning sign of much more rapidly changing climate in Greenland and was only identified six months in advance because some local people said, this isn't right, this is a surprise. So my point here is that if we're gonna try and make sense of climate change and where it's gonna go in terms of a threat of a risk, we need to pay attention to the experts. Those experts could be scientists, those experts could be people that have local embedded knowledge of those changing environments. And that's important too. And the trick is how do we link them in to those that actually have power, resources and solutions and the innovative capacity to make a difference to those warning signs. So it's this idea about how do we make sense of lots of different kinds of information, ecological information, economic information, societal information, and how do we bring those across geographies, across very large time frames, and start to understand what are the early warning signs of change and where do we actually need innovation in a complicated systemic planetary world? Now, the research that I do is often about trying to translate that na those natural science data into something that the boardroom understands and can make sense of, whether it's those material risks that will come down into their business sectors or the opportunities that they need to leverage in order to be part of the economy of the future. In addition, though, all companies out there now increasingly need to know, and we've learned that from the pandemic, that we've got to make the system resilient because we simply cannot operate under a system that is undergoing rapid, radical, and variable change. That's too difficult to actually manage our own little system world. So we have to get the big system as well. Now, my colleagues and I call this ecological sense making. So it's the way of saying that we can't just talk about the world and make it a social or economic uh, framework. We actually have to really pay attention to these quiet, subtle, slow moving until they're fast moving tipping points coming from the natural world. And in order to do that, we need as scientists to try to build innovative information flows from what we do into what you do. Because if you don't actually know the urgency or the areas in which we need some form of technological, social, or economic innovation, that makes all the warning signs we have from science just go out into the air. It's a little bit like all those medical scientists who were saying, we should be worried about the next pandemic and nobody bought PPE, nobody paid attention, nobody connected the dots. It's the same thing with science, but it does mean that we as scientists have to innovate on what our job is. Because classically, science is just about giving the facts. It's not really about trying to make sure those facts are understood and acted upon by people that have power, including both businesses, organizations, and of course, you know, the youth and, and civil society. So the world of innovation to me is really very much about how do we make sense of what's going on now? And how do we make sense and build the future that we need to have? And I think that's where we all have to have innovative collaborative spaces where we actually do that. 